Gentlemen, thank you both uh, for joining us. Wayne Swan, to you first. What is the big lesson you've learnt from the global financial crisis? What would you have done differently? Well, what I learnt from the global financial crisis was how important it was to deploy fiscal policy to keep people in jobs. And the fact that we did that uh, means that we have come out in a stronger position. So as we go forward, we always have to have fiscal policy to the fore. But what I found that was different from anything that I've previously experienced was as we come out of the global financial crisis, was the unwillingness of major players in the economy and big corporates to cooperate on the essential structural reforms we needed to ensure further growth uh, in our like country what? and in the global economy. What, what, what well, are for those? example, the business community and their approach to carbon pricing, an absolutely fundamental reform. They're largely on board, aren't they? No, no, they weren't on board then and they're not necessarily on board now. But we put it through. But what I learnt was that big money and big corporate power is not necessarily on board for a set of policies which not only grow the economy but fairly distribute. But, the, but is the, there anything you would have done differently, even you know, down to how you spent the money? in stimulating the economy. Look, there's no question that there were some programs that didn't work as well as they should have, but overwhelmingly, if we look at the expenditure of the stimulus, it produced the results in so, a broad range of areas. So stimulus would be the way to go if there's another crisis like this. Do you agree with that, Ed Balls? Well, the interesting thing, if you read the reports this year from the IMF and the OECD about the Australian economy, they both say if growth slows markedly, the government should stand ready to use fiscal policy to support growth. So it shows that um, the international consensus is shifting. The fact is, back in 2008, 9, 10, Britain, Australia, America, we were all right to use fiscal action to avoid a depression like the 1930s with cuts in monetary policy. The difference was, in Britain, we stopped in 2010, Wayne carried on, Australia avoided a recession, we, I'm afraid, then had a period of very slow uh, growth and our national debt kept rising and rising and the deficit stayed high. So I think Australia got it right. We started in the right place and absolutely, um, if there's another big crisis, I think um, the international institutions now know fiscal action alongside monetary action is necessary to stop depression. But even if there's not another crisis, you, you're both arguing we've got to do something now about inequality uh, to get the middle income and low income mm. earners earning more and, and you've suggested uh, you know, essentially more stimulus infrastructure spending and so on. Is we certainly, certainly su uh, suggested more expenditure not only in physical infrastructure but also in human infrastructure. That all costs money yes, it does. and that all adds to the debt. But it, it, it may add to the debt in the short term but if you look at the analysis done by the IMF, their analysis shows that countries with balance sheets like ours when interest rates are so low, uh, will grow more strongly and it'll, it will but produce a debt reduction for, dividend. For 10 and years now, and, and debt now is getting near half a trillion dollars in this country, I'm not sure where it is now in yours, but at what point is too, is, is too much debt a problem? Well, David, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't be doing budget repair. We clearly should. But at the same time, we should be borrowing to invest in that productive infrastructure which will drive growth and which will make sure that debt doesn't accumulate as quickly as otherwise would. But yes, there is budget repair that needs to be done. The Labor Party has cooperated with the government on elements of that budget repair because we understand that you need a sustainable budget over time as well. But they've got a blinkered view about public investment. It's ideology that gets in the way here. So, and the so, reality is the one country can't do it on its own. What we're saying is every country needs to do its bit and there are some countries which were in a stronger position. The reality was that um, Germany, for example, could have done more to support growth in the European Union and across um, uh, the world than it's done in the last uh, 10 years. I think America could have done more in the, um, uh, the last five, six, uh, seven years. Uh, Australia did a lot. In Britain we started. There's been a shift in recent years with the government well, now realising they need to do more. Well, you talk about countries working together. That brings us to the issue of trade. Now, there's no doubt that for whatever reason there has been a backlash against uh, free trade. We've seen it with Trump. We've seen it in your country, in Europe as well. Brexit's part, uh, partly uh, due to this as well. What are your thoughts now on free trade, Wayne Swan? Because you did say uh, here today that it is on the nose. Well, certainly on the nose. And we're a great trading nation. And it's in our interest to get public support public support for trade agreements that increase our growth and our national wealth and our national living standards. But if we sign up to those agreements, we can't leave people behind when they are adversely affected. And that's what's occurred particularly in the United States. And in that country, they've had an absence of a range of programs which do exist in this country to help us assist what workers. What does that mean in practical here, example here with so well. car makers, for example? Do we sign these trade deals, our car makers? What do you do to help those people? Well, there was an act, it was an act of vandalism for the government 
government to drive out of Australia the last two car makers. And I believe that was one of the, one of the decisions which really put trade agreements absolutely on the nose. But is con continuing to protect industries like that really the, the answer, do you think? Uh, I think in Britain, the car industry benefiting from trade has been one of our fastest growers in the last uh, 10 years. We now have Different January. here, though. I mean, I'll take a different example, I suppose, in your country. But you keep protecting industry. Is that the best approach? Well, I think if you say to populations, globalisation is just what it is. It may mean stagnant wages and rising inequality, but it's the best you're going to get, so you'll have to put up with it. I'm afraid what you see is population saying no and voting for Donald Trump or for Brexit. On the other hand, um, to turn our face against global trade and all those things is disastrous. So you've got to have policies which make trade fairer, which tackle companies who aren't paying their fair share of tax, and make sure you've got the kind of programs Wayne talked about to boost wages and support workers and give them the security so that they can make globalisation work for them. Gentlemen, good to talk to you both. Thank you. Thank you.